Hello, everyone. Hello. I hear myself. I'm here to talk uh, this morning, I guess this afternoon, about two people who I consider my greatest teachers. And sadly, I really didn't know who they were until they were gone. And um, I dedicated the rest of my life to keep their legacy alive and to also teach the children and the adults about the Holocaust through the eyes of my parents. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm going to ask, how many people here have relatives or people they know who are second generation survivors? Uh, Okay, and I'm saying this because I started a um, Facebook page called Silent Legacy, and these are um, people who are coming onto my website who are talking about their parents and what they went through as Holocaust survivors. But in addition to that, they are coming on my channel to talk about themselves as children of Holocaust survivors, and that's why I call it Silent Legacy, because people like me, a child of the Holocaust, we've had very, I should say, different lives, and a lot of this people do not know, and I'm going to be converting this over to a YouTube channel, and on my channel, I'll be bringing people onto my show who are going to be talking about what it was like being raised by parents who were Holocaust survivors. And this morning, as we get towards the end of my presentation, I will share a story with you, which is a true story about myself. And it is called A Christmas Story and a Jewish Boy. It's a pretty, pretty compelling story about what happened to me when I was five years old. And I'll have many stories to tell on my YouTube channel as well as on my Facebook page. All right, so let me start by telling you who I am. <clears throat> I was actually born um, two weeks uh, after my parents left Munich, Germany in 1949 to come to Ellis Island, New York. And I landed in Ellis Island inside of my mommy's belly. So that's pretty cool. And you know, in the shadows of the Statue of Liberty, my feet didn't touch the ground until I got to Brooklyn, New York, because my mother was carrying me as they got onto the island, which is, you know, I tell people, you know, I mean, if it happened a couple of weeks earlier, I could say I was born on a ship on the Atlantic Ocean. I could say I was born in the Atlantic Ocean. That's where I was born. But fortunately, they made it to the Ellis Island. And even in my book, I go into... Uh, the experience they have when they first see the uh, New York skyline for the first time with 1,500 other refugees that, that, that sailed here from Munich, Germany, um, it's pretty profound. Um, so I'll go into that in just a bit. But anyway, let me back up first and tell you what happened. So once I landed in, we landed in Ellis Island, I moved to central New Jersey. Um, I ended up getting educated in my earlier years, in, well, obviously in high school, and then I went to Kent State University in Ohio, and this was back in the 60s and 70s. I was actually there during the shooting of the four students. I don't know how many people know about Kent State during the Vietnam War. Okay, so I was actually there during the shooting of the four students who were demonstrating against the war when Nixon decided to go into Cambodia. And um, I see a lot of similarities now, except that, you know, it was my generation and all these, all these kids were going to war in Vietnam and they were not coming back. And so we believed even back then we should not be shipping our soldiers out to Vietnam if we felt there was a nowhere situation that they were getting in. So I was pretty much left. I mean, I was part of SDS. I was really against the war. Um, I wasn't the first lottery. I was number 304, and I didn't have to go. Otherwise, I probably would have ended up going to Canada. Uh, but fortunately, that number, and that's what they did back then. You had a lottery number, and they would pick your number. And if you were the first 150 names they called, you were going the next week to, for, for, uh, to the, civil, to the um, selective service to be uh, indoctrinated into the service and to... Um, go for physical and go on, but I didn't have to go through that, thank God. 
So anyway, so um, when I got my degree in psychology and political science, I graduated in the early 70s, and I spent the last 35, 40 years in human resources. I got involved in uh, management training development, technical recruiting. Um, a lot, I got a lot involved in writing job descriptions, and that's how I got my start in writing, was writing job descriptions for big companies. But my main thrust was in management training and in technical recruiting. So for many years, I worked in that area, and then, um, and then I, I guess you could say I semi-retired, and I'm going to now go into a little bit about how this all happened. Um, it took me years to understand what exactly happened to my parents because they never spoke about their experiences. And so I ended up uh, retaining a Lithuanian researcher out of South Africa, and that's a whole different story I'm not going to go into, but I found out later on he turned out to be my second cousin on my father's side. I mean, it was absolutely amazing. Just to give you a quick snapshot, um, what happened was he found my... Uh, I had an e-book before the book came out, and he found this on an obscure website, and he sends me an email telling me that his name is Evan Levine, and he said that my father came from Kadan in Lithuania, and he said, well, my grandfather came from Kadan, and I think you and I are related. And I see this email, and I said, this guy got to be a nutcase. I don't know who this guy is. And so we, we made some exchange on email, and then the next day he came back and sent me a copy of his aunt's address book. And in that address book was my mother's address, phone number, and name, and I realized he was the real deal. At that time, my parents lived in the South Beach in Miami. So we started corresponding, and he told me he did a lot of research on Lithuanian history, and I found out from him that I had two cousins here in this country that I never knew existed at the time, one in, one in California and one in New Jersey. But it, it was an amazing experience to go through this to realize how we connected. And then I met him over at the Brookwood Diner here in, um, in Roswell, and I met him for the first time. We had dinner, and it was, it was really cool stuff. My cousin, I never knew I had a cousin. So anyway, so he was one, and then I ended up calling, getting in touch with Yad Vashem in Jerusalem and the Holocaust Museum in Washington. You will find some of the photographs I have here are from the Holocaust Museum as well as Yad Vashem. I got special permission uh, to use them, and I'll tell you what happened there. Um, then I spoke to my cousin in Tel Aviv, Israel. God rest her soul, she's no longer here. And the rest was a lot of my own research online and contacting people I knew that had some information that I wanted. So that's how I pieced this together. Now, as I was getting to ready to start writing the book, and I will let me back up and say that I am the last surviving member of my family. My brother passed away in 2008 from hepatitis C which he got from tainted blood that was given to him in 1947 in the Fehrenwald displacement camp in Germany. And for years he had that in his, in his system. And then what happened in 92, he ended up buying a Ben and Jerry's down in Key West, Florida. He started drinking and shot out his liver and kidneys. And in 2008 he passed away um, years after he had the Ben and Jerry's. And he had a liver and kidney transplant and within a year, he died. So, and he was only 58 years old. And this was in 2007, around 2007. I knew when he left that I was really the last surviving member of my family. So, moving forward, in 1993, my dad passed away um, in uh, Miami Beach from a long illness. And uh, my brother and I flew down from New York and New Jersey. I was living in New Jersey. My brother was living in New York. And uh, we ended up uh, going through the funeral. And then a couple weeks later, my brother and I decided to sell, wanted to sell the condominium. So um, at, when I went back to my parents' uh, condominium, at that point, my mother was in a nursing home. She ended up coming down. Coming down. She ended up getting uh, Alzheimer's, and then she was in a nursing home for a long time. And so <coughs> there was one night where I went over to the uh, condo to start 
uh, arranging, uh, getting his clothes together and moving it into another room, and we were getting ready for the um, real estate people to come in to actually assess the condo and go into the marketing piece. So as I'm cleaning up the condo, I go into his uh, bedroom, and as I was cleaning out his night table, which had all these different magazines and bills, old bills, and I went to the lower part of his drawer, and I found there a manila folder, and in that folder was documents I never saw before. They were both in German and in English. And these were documents, were testimonies that my parents gave to the attorneys and to the, and to the doctors about what happened to them during the Holocaust and their physical and emotional state that the lawyers were petitioning the German courts in 1964 for reparations for the loss of my sister, their daughter, and their families, um, as well as almost losing themselves as they were in separate concentration camps for almost nine months. It, so here I am, it's 1993, September, and I'm sitting there looking at these documents, and my heart fell to my to my feet because there was so much information they never spoke about. And the way that the way they described what happened with my sister literally being taken out of the arms of the SS in 1944 uh, during the Kindernacht. It was the night of the children's action where the Germans took the children. And it was talk about my father taking the electrical, uh, the bodies off the electrical fences in Dachau because my father was an electrician. It goes into all this this horrible, horrible stuff that I never even knew about. So this was 1990, uh, 1993, and um, I ended up taking those documents. I showed them to my brother, and my brother is very stoic. He didn't really, he really didn't react one way or the other. And I took the documents back home to New Jersey, and for years, I just put them into my desk. And and honestly, in 2000. 17, when I started writing the book, um, I didn't really, I don't really remember what exactly happened as to what bought, brought me to the point where I wanted to tell their story to the public. But I guess it was because I was getting older and I knew that if I didn't tell their story, they would never, no one would ever know who they were. They were just two people who got caught up in the Holocaust. They lived rather ordinary lives, and then they passed away. And I was not going to let that happen, because if I didn't tell that story, no one would ever know what happened. So, um, so I started writing this book in 2017, and I'm, gonna, I'm going to describe how what happened. I'm in my room, uh, 10, 11 at night, and I'm getting ready to start typing on my computer. And, um, and so as I started the manuscript, I felt an energy in the room that I can't tell you. I felt like I looked over my shoulder, and I, it was almost like I felt someone was, was looking at me. And it was a very strange feeling, because I felt an energy in the room that I could not explain. So I start the first, and I'm still very unnerved, so I'm starting the typing away, and all of a sudden, I feel people... At that time, I didn't know who they were. They were talking in my ear. I could feel things that they were telling me. And I realized soon after that my fingers were on the keyboard and they were just, it was almost as if they had a mind of their own. My fingers were racing across the board. I was coming up with words and images I didn't even know exist. I mean, I, I used words I never used, but in the book I did. And I re realized soon after that those people were my parents. And so here I am typing away. The next morning I would get up. The, when I first started, I'd look down on my computer, and I didn't even remember writing. And even now, when I look at my book, it's like it's hard for me to believe that I wrote it. But it, it was, and what happened from there was they are here. There's no question. My parents are with me all the time. The things that happened to me were absolutely amazing. I mean, I had one night where I was typing and there was a big storm outside in Alpharetta, and a, a big tree branch fell from a tree that must have been about 200 feet in the air. It was middle of the night, and I felt it crash on my deck of my condo. 
And I didn't look at it until the next morning. When I looked at it the next morning, it looked like a tree that landed in the middle of the flower pot that it landed in. And it was like the tree of life. It looked like all these, I mean, and I, then I tried to pull it out of the flower pot. I couldn't do it. So it just sat there on my deck. I mean, that was, that was an ama one, of, one of the more amazing experiences that happened to me. So, um, so anyway, so what I'm saying is, this is not my book, and this is not my story. This is their book, and it's their story. I'm only standing here to be the conduit between them and myself. They should be here standing talking about what I'm going to talk about, but I'm basically the messenger. I did not write this book. They wrote this book. I have people saying to me now, how do you know all this? You know, I go into some detail, and I'm telling you, they were in my ear writing for most of this book. I was just moving my fingers, and they were telling me what was going on. And I guess what they call is channeling. And, you know, with, with a conservative synagogues, and, you know, they go into them, they think this is a little bit too out there. But I'm telling you, this is exactly what happened. So the book basically is a book of contrast. It's a spiritual book. It's a book between the light and the darkness. It's between love and hate. And it's between one man, Adolf Hitler, against the love of two people whose, lo whose love would not be denied. And so it was, um, it was very important for me to understand, very important for me to express myself in the sense that this is a spiritual book and I wanted people to understand that more than anything else. When people think about the Holocaust, and about the, the Jews getting murdered and all this, they, they think about all well, that happened, I think, from a reality point of view. But it is a spiritual book, and that's what I want my audience to remember. Um, so I'm getting so caught up, I'm not even moving the slides. Um, the, the how and the why, why they survived. And once we get this up, I'll show you that in the country of Lithuania, 97% uh, of the Jewish population were exterminated, of about 160,000. It all depends. You had some Polish that came into Lithuania when Germany invaded Poland. We, there was only somewhere around four or 5,000 who survived. And the fact that both of them lived, uh, when you have like 97% of the locals. And by the way, people ask me, how did so many Jews die in Lithuania when the Germans arrived, and the answer is that there was the locals, there was a lot of anti-Semitism going on for generations. And the Lithuanian locals were part of the reason because they were Nazi sympathizers, and they would go into the homes of the Jewish families, and they would slaughter them in their homes. And that's how my grandparents on both sides of my family all right, so right here, you'll see Lithuania, um, almost 97%. I didn't even know this, because when, when you see all the countries in Europe, and there's other ones, I didn't know until I did my research that that number was going to be that high. And then I realized in the whole, the whole continent of Europe, Lithuania came in number one as the most Jews who died during the war. And so I realized... Um, how did my parents survive uh, and why? And this is where the spiritual piece comes in. Um, my parents had a special bond between each other, and their love continued right up to the time they both parted years later. And they also had a tremendous faith. Now, I want you to know, and I'll go into this in a minute, my, my grandfather... And I'm hoping that, all right, so this, this goes into the total population of Europe, and then you see that the estimated uh, killed and the percentage. All right, so this is where I wanted to go to. That is my grandfather on my right. His name is Chaim Kex, my, mother, my grandmother, uh, Chaya. My mother is on the top right, and my Aunt Sarah is to the left, holding on to her her, her daughter, and um, oh, I think that's a cousin. 
the little baby there. That is a cousin of mine, and I'm going to tell you a really interesting story about this. When I, and this came from my family album. When I first saw this family album, this child's face was marked off with a pencil. There was no face there. It was just black. And for a long time, I thought it was something in the, in the, in the picture that a well, fungus or something got on the picture and for a long time, I showed this photograph, and there was no face there. So my developer, who was working on the, my book, took some hand soap and put it on the face. And because she, came, she looked through it through a, micro, through a magnifying glass, and she saw it. She said, this is a pencil mark. And she took a little hand soap and put it on the face, and that was the baby's face that came out. And it totally devastated me, because I realized that that child who had that marking over that face, remind, it had to have been my mother, because there's only two people, four, my brother and I, but there were only two people who could have done that, and it could have been either my mother or my father, and I think my mother must have taken a pencil and penciled out that, child, that little baby's face. And when, when, I, when I saw that after she got the, the soap off the, the, off the picture, I was devastated. Because she must have done that sometime when they were over here, and I never knew about it. I always thought it was something wrong with the, with the, with the uh, picture. So anyway, everyone you see here, this is not all my family. My mother was one of nine children. Uh, there were six girls and three boys. Uh, the only ones that lived were my mom, my Aunt Sarah, and Rivka, who went to Finland before Germany arrived in Lithuania. So out of the nine, three lived. Interestingly enough, all three ended up with Alzheimer's, which is, well, I guess, I, you know, I don't know, I guess it's kind of runs in the family, but they all died of this. Well, you really can't die of Alzheimer's. You die of some compl complications. But they all passed away uh, f from that disease. So it was my mom, my, my aunt Rivka, and my aunt Sarah that survived. Now, there are three, I have uh, three uh, brothers, two were rabbis. <clears throat> I come from a long line of rabbis. Ukraine, uh, Poland. So my ancestors are very, what they call frum. You know, they were very religious. My grandfather was very well known, a little town of Majek, Majek, Lithuania. And um, he was very well liked by the community. The city itself wasn't more than a couple thousand people, I think. It wasn't a big town. This here in the middle is the housekeeper uh, that took care of the family. Her name is Nora. My mother is in the top right, and my Aunt Sarah is to the left. If you look very closely, there's a, my cousin has a, like a little metal circle there with a, then there's a little stick. They, back then in the 30s, they would skip this thing down the, down the street with the stick and the metal piece. Um, you notice there's no one smiling in the photograph as well. And from what I was told back then, the photographer did not want them to smile. I guess there must have been reason. I guess it's the, the way they were taking the photographs back then. So again, these are um, Nora was the one who were, was taking care of my family. My grandfather was um, very well known in the community. He would he would uh, give us um, he, he'd go and talk about the. Uh, the Old Testament, and the, uh, and he was giving a lot of, he taught a lot of the young people in the town. He had a shul that uh, he ran. Uh, he was very strict with my family. Uh, my mother, uh, at times, was a little bit rambunctious, and she, she didn't follow the letter of the law the way my grandfather wanted her to be, but she told me that... Um, she told me, I'm sure my aunts would have said the same thing, that she was uh, my, dad, my grandfather's favorite. But the bottom line is he was well-liked by the community, especially in the Jewish community. And uh, they lived on a farm. From what I remember, it was uh, quite a big farm. They, they raised uh, livestock. They had various types of crops that they ended up um, growing. And my father also made his own wine, which became very popular in the town. That's my father. Uh, my father served in the Lithuanian Reserve. 
And I want to tell you a little bit about my family. My, my mother came from a rather f- wealthy family, rabbi. He was very well liked. He had, a, he had land. My father, on the other hand, came from a very poor family. My grandfather, and I'm named after my grandfather on my father's side. My real name is not Michael Ruskin. My real name is Meyer Ruxin, M-E-Y-E-R. And my last name is R-U-K-S-E-N. When my parents arrived in Ellis Island, the person at the customs, you know, they had a very heavy Yiddish accent, the European accent, and they put down Ruskin, David Ruskin, rather than David Ruxin. And my birth certificate says Meyer Ruxin. So if you look at my birth certificate, it's not Michael Ruskin. How I came up with Michael Ruskin, Meyer and Michael, but my last name is not. And I, I get people who say to me, are you related to a Lily Ruskin or some Ruskin? I said, no, that's not my last name. Um, but anyway, so my, my father's side of the family, my grandfather ran a haberdashery. I don't know if you know what that is. It's uh, scarves, and not, uh, scarves and hats and belts. And they lived in, a, in a, a small apartment in the middle of the street. They had an apartment upstairs, and the store was downstairs. So my father came from a very poor background. I also have an Aunt Rose, who was my father's sister. And they ran the store until my grandfather passed away on my father's side. And then my grandmother um, and my father and my aunt ran the store. Uh, my dad was really good in electronics. He was in the, in the city. He would go around and repair electrical equipment in people's homes. He was fascinated with electricity ever since he was young. And then, obviously, he ended up becoming an electrician when he got to this country. And the fact that he was an electrician, they kept him alive in the Dachau camp to make sure the electrical work. And he was the one responsible for taking the bodies off the fences. And that was, that's a whole different story. So, um, so they ended up uh, living a rather conservative uh, Jewish life, very poor. My mother came from a very wealthy family, and I will tell you that my grandfather on my mother's side did not want my mom to marry my dad because you are the daughter of a rabbi. You should marry someone within, you know, with that high class status. But that, that didn't happen. And there's my mom and dad. This is, this is after their liberation. Um, and you'll see as I go into this further, the coat that she's wearing is the coat she wore throughout the entire time she was in, Lith- in the, uh, the Ferenval displacement camp. Okay, now we're getting into the time when the Germans ended up invading Kaunas. And there you see the Nazis. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of historical detail because I've done this before and the people's eyes glaze over when I start talking about the Russians and the Germans and the, the non-aggression pact that Stalin made with Hitler about the sphere of influence where the western part of Europe was going to be taken over by the Germans and the eastern part was going to be taken over by the Russians and they made a pact that neither one was going to invade each other's sphere of influence. Well, obviously that did not happen. So the Germans ended up rolling through Poland. They destroyed everything in their wake. I mean, thousands and thousands had died. The the Warsaw Ghetto started back then. And what they did in Lithuania is there's a lot of similarities between putting uh, the Jews in ghettos and the kids I heard about the ghettos. Um, They would bob wire the town. They would put the Jews in there and they would not, they would not, they would not have any type of contact with the outside, at least initially they did, but eventually they did. They had to wear stars of David on their shirt. They, could, they had to walk in the gutter. They had to give up their typewriters, their radios, everything that they had any kind of communication to the outside. The Germans wanted to get rid of that. They got rid of the books. Uh, they gave them rations that were just like you know, a potato, a piece of meat once in a while, some soup. Uh, they tried, some of the Jews in the, in the ghetto tried to end up uh, uh, making their own food or, or actually growing uh, food out in the back of their area that, where they lived. And it was even to the point where they were bartering through the fences, through the wire fences. They would give up certain items to end up getting food or something in return. And if the Germans found this out, they would be shot. It was a very, very tough life. And in my book, I go into exactly what happened. My, my parents ended up living in a um, 
two-bedroom apartment with three different families. And um, it, it, was, it was a very tough situation for everybody in the ghetto at that point. All right, so this is a picture of the Germans invading Poland. And I say this in my book. I got pictures that are something similar to what happened in, Lithu in Lithuania, but I don't have them here. This is, when they were first, this is the first when the Germans first arrived in Poland. I mentioned before I have two brothers, Joseph and David. The one uh, on the right is David. The one on the left is Joseph. Noah was uh, one of the friends. They, they all went to yeshiva. Now, I don't know if you know this, but Lithuania, especially Kovna, was considered the Jerusalem of Europe. They were known for the yeshivas and their education. They were brilliant people that studied Torah, and they were very well known around the world for their education. Noah ended up going out with my mom for a while, and then he uh, went into the service and he was shot, and he passed away. So the two on the end were my uncles. They, too, were killed by the, by the locals. And again, I want to stress to you, people say, the Nazis, the Nazis did, killed all the Jews. And I'm, you know, and I'm not trying to cast a persuasion on the, the uh, Lithuanians, but there were a lot of Lithuanians, and there was a lot of anti-Semitism that came out all through that period. And so when the Germans came into Lithuania, uh, my mother told me this. She goes, show us the houses that have the Jews. And then they would say to Lithuanians, go get your guns, your machetes, your pipes, your knives. And they ended up killing a lot of the local Jews, which before people say it must have been the Nazis. It was the Nazis, but a lot of it were the locals. And this happened in other countries too. It was not only in Lithuania. There were a lot of locals that, and look what's going on now with what's going on in the country. I mean, there was an undercurrent of anti-Semitism. It's never gone away. You know, the, the, some of these protesters are just, they're just like Nazis. Um, so when the Germans arrived, the, the, a lot of the, the Lithuanians thought that they would get sovereignty if they really did a good job and killed the, the Jews, but that did not happen. Um, and eventually, the Lithuanians themselves were sent to Siberia, along with the Jews, and most did not come back. Now, there's other reasons why, um, why this happened. First of all, a lot of the Lithuanians were blaming the Jews for collaborating with the Russians. And I don't want to get into a lot of detail here. But when they annexed L Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia, uh, when the Russians arrived after Germany went into Poland, the Russians were taking a lot of the Lithuanian locals and they were shipping them up to Siberia. They were taking over all the stores, the factories, and, and there was a lot of um, repression going on with the local, uh, the local Lithuanians. And so when the Russians were pushed back, when Germany, when, when the Nazis ended up in Lithuania, they pushed the Russians back over the border. And that's when... The Germans gave full reign to the Lithuanians to go ahead and, and kill the Jews because they felt all along the collaboration between the uh, Russians and the Jews were one of the reasons why a lot of the Lithuanians were killed or shipped up into uh, Siberia. And so a lot of my family were killed uh, um, by the locals. Now, I'm going to go into now a little bit about the Kovna ghetto. There are two areas of distinction about what happened in the ghetto. There was a selection process and the raids to the houses. What happened is when the, when the Jews were put into the ghetto, there were raids, unannounced raids by the German SS and others that ended up going into the homes, the, the apartment buildings that were in the ghetto, and they would go in and take the jewelry, the clothes, the appliances, and then they would take that right out of their apartments. They, they took the rings off the, the women's fingers. They took suits and everything they could get their hands on, and they would either sell it on the black market or give it to their families. And these raids were constant. And during that time, um, my dad, who, uh, as I said, was, a, was ready working in electrical, 
uh, he ended up digging a, a spider hole. And a spider hole is a hole in the ground where he put some of the rations. So when the raids were coming in, my mom and my dad would hide underneath the floorboard so they wouldn't get caught. So what happened was, um, this was going on a long time. And I'm, I'm going fast forward now. In 19, while I'm bringing this up, this is, um, this is Lena. Uh, she was one who was murdered. And I want to go into this just a little bit more. So when my father was sent out to do, was on a, a work detail, and my mom was home in this apartment, um, I go into this in my book. The Germans were raiding the house in 1944. It was the Kindernacht. And they did that because they, they were going to be liquidating the ghetto and they wanted to exterminate the children because, first of all, they believed that they, there was, um, the, the women were being encumbered by having to raise children. And to the Germans, it was all about working the Jews to death. No, in, I think it was in Auschwitz to say, work will set you free. So what happened was that the last, one of the last raids in the Kovna ghetto was taking the children under the age of 12. And so, and I go into this in my book, it was, it was a, this chapter six, The Death of Innocence, was the hardest chapter for me to write. When I first saw Lena's face, uh, I mean, it's, I, I started crying. I mean, the innocence of that child is just, I, even now I have a hard time looking at it. She actually died along with my sister. Now, I don't have a picture of my sister, but she died in the Kovna ghetto exactly at the same time, and she was, she was actually the same age as my sister Rose. And, um, and so I use this as the representation of the 1600. For a lot of historians, they considered what happened during the Kovna ghetto, the, the uh, Kindernacht. It was one of the tragedies of world, one of the greatest tragedies of World War II. And a lot of people didn't realize what happened. In fact, as I did my research, many of the books I read and, and looked into, they talk about it, a lot about the camps, but the numbers of Jews that got killed in the ghetto are unbelievable. I mean, the numbers are off the charts. And I didn't see too many books about talking about the ghettos. The ghettos was a really terrible place. This leads to what I was going to talk about, the selection, which let me just go into this a little bit. These are two of the children um, who also, they, they were Abraham, Rosenthal, and Emmanuel. Some of these pictures I got from the Holocaust Museum. Some of these pictures I got from Yad Vashem. I will tell you that what I mentioned before about the uh, documents I found in my father's night table, those documents are in my book, and those documents are now at the Holocaust Museum in Washington. And I got special permission for some of these photographs that they, they gave to me as just because my parents' story is in their library. So these are two of the children that passed. And again, this was during the Kindernacht. Um, this is Hannah. She actually lived. Um, she was, uh, her and her parents ended up getting into some kind of what I remember, like a, a, uh, a shack, a potato shack somewhere in, the, in a farm, and then the Christian family ended up saving their lives. All right, so this is where, now this is the uh, selection, and I, I, many of you probably know this. When they first, when they first, the Germans first arrived in the ghetto, and again, you've got to remember, they were very clever. They had all the Jews in one section. So they could use systematically kill the Jews by keeping them bob wired in the town, and that's how they would they, they would kill many of them. They had quotas to meet. Berlin would tell them, "We want these many Jews to die today." This what was going on here is they were um, being selected. If you were going to the right and you were young enough and healthy enough, you would live. If you went to the left, you were too old. Or too sickly, you would go to the, the left and then go into the extermination building, which was outside of the ghetto. It was a fort that the Russians built back in the 1800s that was converted to an extermination camp. It was, it was Fort 9. So they would be standing in line for hours waiting to be examined by the SS officers. Half of them were either on drugs or they were drunk. And they were ending up examining 
the, the, the captives about were they well enough to work or are we going to put them to death? And so everyone was examined. My mother, I go into that in my book, and my mother, um, I remember one time she said to me, she told my aunt to pinch, pinch your cheeks because it gives you some red in your face so you look like you're healthy enough to work. And so, and you can imagine, a lot of them tried to escape because these, are, again, these were unannounced raids that the Germans were taking the people from the city square and putting them online to be examined for whether to work or you're going to die. Miraculously, my aunt and my aunt, my sister, my aunt, my mom, and my dad were all in the same, in the same, uh, uh, the called in the ghetto. <clears throat> they all survived, but many of them did not. Some tried to escape or were shot. Some um, actually fainted in line. I mean, they, they were standing for hours, and you could imagine, just imagine, you're standing in line waiting to be examined by some SS officer who's half drunk. And he was the ex executioner as well as the judge as whether you're going to live or die. And so the, the type of stress, and this was going on regularly. You're standing in line waiting to be examined by someone thinking, are you going to live or are you going to die? So this is just one of the, this is one of the pictures, one of the SS officers who examined. They all, as I said, they all wore stories of David here as well. Okay, so this is the Dachau concentration camp. Uh, my father was there, so let me go in now to how the vow happened. In 1944, in July, the Germans were planning on liquidating the ghetto, and they were going to be shipping the remaining Jews, and there were about 30,000 Jews in that ghetto, and there were, I think there were less than 3,000 that survived out of the 32,000. And again, when you think about my mom and dad surviving, it was absolutely, it, it's, a, it's just Hashem, you know, it was just a miracle. So they were taking the, the men and the boys in, into one train and the women and the young girls to another. The men were being shipped to Dachau. The women were being shipped to Stutthof, which is a camp in northern Poland, not far from the Baltic. And so they gathered them in the city square, and they knew they were being separated. They were not told by the Germans as to what they were doing, other than the fact they were being resettled for their own safety. And that was exactly the same reason they got the Jews to go into the ghetto in 1942, 41, 42, because the Lithuanians were killing all the Jews. So what happened was the German hierarchy said, okay, well, I brought some of the higher level Jewish committee together. We're going to move you into the ghetto for your own safety because this way the Lithuanians won't be able to kill you. This is how cunning they were. But they knew that once they got them into the ghetto, they were sitting ducks. So what happened was my, my dad and my mom were together on the train platform knowing they were being separated because the men were going on one train and the women on the other, that they, at that time they made a vow that if either one were to live, they were to go back where they first met five years earlier because they got married in 1939, and they were to see if the other one was still alive. They didn't know where they were going. All they knew is that they were being separated by by gender. And so that vow became the name of my book, The Vow, A Love Story, and The Holocaust. My, my mom and dad were married in 39. My grandfather ended up uh, presiding over the, over the wedding, and they made a vow in 39. They made a vow in 1944. And then um, in 1990. Let me see, 1989, they celebrated their 40th wedding anniversary. Um, so, and so my father goes to Dachau, and my mother goes to Stutthof. I go into the book about what happened once they get there. They were living in barracks that were like for, I don't know, maybe 50 people, and they had like two or 300. No facilities, no running water. There was no, they had a couple of... Um, toilets that they were using, it, they weren't working. Uh, when the Americans ended up um, liberating Dachau, they, they, the, the rats were running all over the place because there was food all over. It was, it was a horrible experience. They, some of them uh, 
were en ended up uh, being gassed. Some of them, they had the portable gas uh, trucks that they were using, and some just committed suicide. Then they worked them to death. They worked in the factories, and they worked also in small groups inside the, uh, the concentration camp, making small um, equipment for the Germans. This is the only picture of my book that, uh, that's a little bit graphic. These are some of the survivors. Some of them didn't even live. These are the barracks I was telling you about. Um, and it was, it was unimaginable living conditions there. And a lot of them died of typhus. Uh, there was a lot of disease. There was, it was so overcrowded. In my book, I talk about, I talk about the, um, the Americans, once they found the Dachau concentration camp, they had a scouting detail that went out into the field outside of Dachau, and they found all these boxcars, and the boxcar had all these children and and, and the families in there, and they didn't even open up the cars to let them out because the Dachau camp was so overcrowded. They actually died inside those boxcars. And when the, the GIs found, found those, and I talk about this, some of them psychologically had really, they had a very bad time after watching, opening up the doors and seeing all these dead bodies. And I'm talking about 15 to 20 boxcars that were never opened. These were fortunate enough to live, at least most of them. Okay, so, so oh, here it is. So here we are. My father is in Dachau. My mother is in Stutthof. Now, Stutthof is a camp in northern Poland, about 20 miles, 10 to 20 miles, somewhere in that vicinity to the Baltic. And when the Americans were now closing in um, and the Russians were closing in on liberation, um, the Germans decided to relocate them through death marches. I don't know how much you heard about the death march. They would march them to different camps to get away from the Allies so they would continue to work. And a lot of them died, because, uh, as I said, they would work them to death 18-hour days, a couple hours of sleep, and they were back working again. And so, um, and so when the GIs and the Americans were, were, were now getting close to liberating the concentration camps, they would have these death marches. My mother was liberated by, um, well, let me just tell you what happened. So they ended up uh, walking for miles. I think it was like 12 or 13 miles from the, uh, the camp in Stutthof to the Baltic Sea. And there at the Baltic Sea, they were to get onto barges that was going to take them to Germany to continue to work. So on the death march, they would have to walk for miles. And I'm talking about people that were already sickly or old. They were given like a piece of cheese and some food just to get them going. And they would just have them travel up into the Baltic to travel to the Baltic to get onto these boats. If you didn't keep up with the marchers, the Germans would open up machine guns and they would just shoot you right there on the ground. <clears throat> this was going on for eight, eight, nine days. They would stop at churches or barns where they would sleep and then they would get back on the road going up to, uh, up to the Baltic Sea. This I didn't find out until I spoke to uh, the Holocaust Museum about my mother and my aunt being part of the death march to, uh, to, to uh, the Baltic from uh, the Stutthof camp. And I didn't know this until I called them and they, did, they checked their records and yeah, my mom and my aunt was part of that group. I didn't know that. So, um, so what happened was my mom and my, da my, mom and my aunt uh, were liberated by the Russians only two and a half miles away from the beach. And, if my, mo and my mom already had frostbite and so did my aunt. And if they had made it to the beach, the chances are very, very strong they would not have survived. They would have been shot in the water because they were, my mom almost fell to the ground even before she got there. The Russians were along the side of the road in the, of the, one of the forest areas and came out. And there was a fight, and I talk about this in my book, uh, there was a firefight between the German guards and the Soviets and the Russians ended up shooting the guards, and that's how my mother and my aunt were liberated. So it's an incredible story. And um, 
there were some people that made it to the barge, but once they got to Germany, they were, they were killed once they were inside the concentration camps there. But, I mean, you could imagine how Hashem ended up saving their lives. It, it's just miraculous, I mean, when you think about it. Um, so my father, on the other hand, was liberated by the Americans, the Dachau concentration camp, but he, too, was on a death march. But it wasn't as dramatic as what my mother went through. He was liberated by the Americans. They surrounded them. They were going to southern Germany, uh, some mountain range out there. They're trying to get away from the Allies. Uh, and he, he was liberated by the U.S. GIs. It's General Eisenhower. I go into my book about uh, General Eisenhower and D-Day. Uh, here he is talking to some of the paratroopers. And God bless them. I, I dedicated part of my book to the Allied forces, to the, the partisans, and the, the big part, I really dedicated my book to my, my mom and my sister, but uh, they, they, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here. All right, there's D-Day Normandy. They're landing in Normandy. They're landing in France, and they're now landing on what would be the beginning of the end for the Germans. This is an iconic picture of the liberation of Dachau. You see the American flag in the background. Uh, they are greeted by the, some of the prisoners in their striped uniforms, and you see them greeting by some of the allies. It was just, and um, I have this in my book. It's also on my website. It's an incredible photograph that was taken uh, by one of the photographers that worked for one of the papers back then. Okay, so now we're at the mission. As I mentioned before, my parents made a vow. My father was liberated um, within a couple of weeks. He had, some, he had beatings. He was, he was suffering from malnutrition. The doctors did not want to let him out of the infirmary, but he actually got out, and he made the vow, what he said he was going to do. He traveled through three different countries. And again, everything I'm telling you now is documented. This, this particular story I found in my father's company's newsletter. He worked as a electrician in a factory in New Jersey, uh, a paint factory. My dad died of bladder cancer. Obviously, he had a lot of lead in the paint. Um, but he was interviewed by a local, one of the HR people there, and he talks about the mission he was on. He traveled through uh, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and I think it was Poland, those countries right bordered by Germany. And while he was on his mission, he would stop along the, dis the, uh, the displacement camps. I don't know if you know what that is. They would take the refugees who made it through, and they would put them in displacement camp waiting to immigrate to Israel, uh, England, Australia, South America. And so my father would end up having a map, mapping out to go from Germany up into Lithuania looking for my mother, but he would stop along the displacement camps along the way as he was traveling to see if my mother and the Kovna ghetto women were in these displacement camps. And he, he, spent, he was there like six to eight weeks. He was going from camp to camp. He was being picked up by GIs, by truckers that would take him to the next camp. He would walk. He did this for almost two months. And I'm not going to go into how how they reunited, it's an incredible, incredible story. I will tell you that um, when my mother, when my, my sister was literally taken out of the arms uh, of my mom, uh, one of the SS officers turned around and hit my mother in the back of the head with his rifle, and she hit the floor. The people next door picked her up and put her in the apartment, there's one, uh, Sam, which was the person in the apartment next door, was one of the ones that ended up, well, I'm already telling you part of it, he ended up meeting my dad, and then the rest I'll leave to you. But I will tell you this. My mother did tell me this. She said when she was in a, um, my mother had typhus. She had 90 pounds, no hair, and she was in a, in a, a makeshift uh, Red Cross building. And my mother told me when she looked up at my father, not knowing if he was still live, li uh, alive or dead, and she was already hallucinating. She was only hours away from death. She looked up on my dad, and she said, David, are you taking me to heaven? She said, are we in heaven? She really thought my father was an angel coming back to take her to heaven. And she told me that. 
And, and my father, we ended up, um, it goes into how, what happened. They ended up getting her into a hospital and she survived. But anyway, so my point is that my father had the vow. He was not going to relinquish that. He was going to find my mother one way or the other. Okay, this gets into a really interesting story. That happens to me, that happens to be General Eisenhower in one of the uh, schools in the displacement camp. My mother opened up a school in Fehrenwald that had um, about 4,500 refugees in there. And he, she opened up a school that, um, an education program for the children and the adults who were the orphans of the parents who died during the war. There is my mother on the right side, and I found this on the Yad Vashem website. My mother's on the right. You can know she's wearing the same coat. These are all the children that she taught, and she was honored. And I got a picture of General Eisenhower in my book. She, he is standing there with dignitaries from the UN and the military. And um, my brother is now three months old, and there's a baby carriage, and my brother is in that baby carriage with General Eisenhower behind him. So a, a GI must have taken the photograph and given it to my dad. So anyway, so these are the kids. A really interesting story is I have a friend by the name of Lucy Gertner from the Bronx. She's now in her mid-80s. She told me that she was one of the children in this photograph. And I didn't know this. I've known Lucy since I was 14. And when I spoke to her about two years ago, she said that she is one of these kids. And I didn't even know. And I've known Lucy since I was a little kid. But anyway, so she ended up uh, opening up a school. My mother was, spoke six languages, which is not that unusual because back then in Europe, you spoke a lot of different languages. And so she was well-equipped to teach the children about the various subjects they were teaching back then. And there's General Eisenhower right there. So he's, he's on the right there. And my brother's in the baby carriage. These are some of the dignitaries. And um, I... We took this picture. I had it examined. Uh, it's the same picture. He has his hat off. Um, there's another picture of him. And this is in the Fehrenwald camp. And there is my brother when he was just, I think it was like two. No, that, he was much younger than that. It was like 60. This was in 1940, 46, 46. He was born in July. So that is a picture of General Eisenhower. And that, she was recognized. My mother did tell me something and by the way, the way my mother would tell me things when they, she did say things, it was usually around the holidays, and she would just come up with some snippets of information. I really didn't follow through with her because either I was too wrapped up with myself and I thought it was in the past at that point. I was very young. Um, but she did tell me that she was given flowers and she did make a, a, a speech in front of a group, and this was it. Okay, so this is... Um, my aunt and my mom, 1947, and they made it through. My aunt ended up going to Jerusalem, and she passed away years ago, but she ended up meeting a man in the camp, and they got married, and they, they went to Jerusalem. That's the, my brother's bar mitzvah in 1961. I'm the little kid in the bottom there, the little precocious kid. It's my mom and dad. That's my brother. And there's a picture of my folks. Um, that was 1946. This, this photo is, uh, they're celebrating their 40th wedding anniversary in New York City. And on the left is my parents when they first, when they first were liberated. And that's me. Okay, so um, one of the questions I end up getting almost all the time is, what was it like to be raised by Holocaust parents? I started, a, if you're interested, I started a, um, a Facebook page, a Facebook group that is bringing board second generation survivors. And they're telling their parents' story, but they're also telling their story. So that's why I call it the silent legacy. A lot of people don't understand that the children, the children have a lot to say about how they were raised. Um, incredible stories. What I'm doing, and by the way, we're working on a documentary film, and we are in the midst now of possibly getting a motion picture from the book. And we're talking now to people out in Los Angeles, so that's going on. We're going to open up a YouTube channel, where, and this is going around the world. We're going to get a lot of 
second generation children coming on to the YouTube channel where we're going to have conversations about the parents and about the kids, me, the children. Because there are so many incredible stories that the second generation has that they just have no one to, to tell. So I am opening up this channel so these people from all, all areas of the world are going to come on and tell us their story and tell us the story of their parents and their story of, of what happened to them. So if you, and again, the name of the web, the name of the um, Facebook group is called Silent Legacy, Second Generation and the Descendants, the community. I'm going to read to you what I just put on there two days ago. And it's, pro it's quite profound because I have stories that I'll go into a little bit with you. You want to hang in there. Um, about what happened to me as a child. The name of this little article I have on my Facebook group is called A Christmas Story and a Jewish Boy. This is all true. Dateline, Central New Jersey, December 25th, 1955 at 7 a.m. in the morning. A wintry mix was falling under a grayish sky and the road and trees were still covered with snow as a few cars were slowly driving by as you could hear the chains of the tires hitting the slush on the road. A six-year-old boy, Michael, woke up early while his parents were still asleep. He rushed to the living room window, excited to see the light snow falling and the Christmas lights twinkling in the windows of the homes across the street. It looked like a perfect Christmas card an artist would have painted. Michael quietly rushed back into his bedroom, mindful of his parents still being asleep. He reached into his dresser drawer for green construction paper that he got from school a few days earlier and began drawing a wreath. Carefully, he drew a circle on the paper and cut it out with his scissors. Perfect, he thought. He then found some tape and quickly rushed back to the window. What did I say? Looking, feeling the joy of the holiday, which he knew very little about, except he knew there was a Santa Claus and he knew that there was Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. Um, so he taped the wreath to the window thinking this would be a great, a great fit for the houses in the neighborhood. As he stood gazing out the window through the wreath, he suddenly hears footsteps from behind. His father approaches him and notices the wreath hanging from the window. He looked down at young Michael and without a word slapped him across the face. This is what happened. Um, and then he says, Michael, don't you ever do this again. You are Jewish, and this is not your holiday. Michael, confused and bewildered, began to cry and runs back into his room, not understanding what happened. And that was a story about me at five years old. I remembered that distinctly. I remember staying at the window with the reef. It was snowing out. My father comes out and just right across the face. But then you've got to understand, I mean, my, you know, what they went through during the war, uh, there was a lot of suspicion going on. If you weren't Jewish, they were very, they were very suspicious about the things that, um, whether they were going to be accepted. Growing up, uh, my mother would say to me before I'd go out to play, don't tell anybody we're refugees. I don't want anybody to know. Of course, my parents had such a heavy accent. How could you not know that they were not refugees? But they didn't, they didn't want anyone to know. And I don't know, was, was it because they wanted to feel assimilated into the community or whether they just felt guilt that they made it through the war? But that was one of the things they would talk about. And if you want, I can just go into a few other things. My mother would walk me to school at the age of five and six years old. My, when my parents first arrived in the United States, my mother worked as a seamstress. She would sew hems on dresses. My father worked as a day laborer. In the, uh, in the paint factory. She'd get out of work early 
and stand in the schoolyard waiting for me to come out of school at 3 o'clock, take me by the hand, and walk me home every day. While my schoolmates were all hanging around with the kids and they're walking home with their friends, my mother was walking me home. So she didn't want to leave me out of her sight. And this is how, and these are the kinds of stories that it's, what happened to me, it happened to a lot of second generation survivors. She, she was extremely smothering. She was, very, she was hovering over me all the time because of the loss of her own daughter. Psychologically, she didn't, nef, definitely didn't want to lose another child. So she was, she was very, very strict. She was very critical. Um, I remember one Passover, I ended up taking all the dishes out of my, out of the, out of the, out of the break front that day. My, my parents ended up getting very expensive dishes from Germany. I don't even know how they got there, but they were made and they were given to my parents and they were labeled in the back, uh, it was like, uh, 1897, whatever, but it was the very expensive dishes. I took them all out of the cupboard, washed every one of them. It was a, a place setting for 12. I thought I'd get on my parents' good side. My mother comes home from work, and she's yelling at me for taking the dishes out and washing them without breaking them. And I thought this would be a good thing. I would help connect my mom, and it was never enough. It was never enough. Anyway, so um, that was one of the things that happened um, as, as a child. Um, let me just quickly go into a few more things that happened to me. Um, let me see what I got here. Okay, so... Um, Now we can't find what I wanted to say. Let me see if I could figure out a few more things. Sorry about this, guys. Okay. All right, so they had a feeling of shame and guilt. Um, the shame of that they, they made it through the camp, and uh, the guilt they instilled in my brother and me. Um, it, was never, it was never good enough. Uh, if, I didn't, if I didn't become the good little Jewish boy in my family, uh, my mother would give me the cold shoulder. She wouldn't talk to me for days. And so if I ended up becoming the little good Jewish boy she wanted me to be, I would be on her good side. But I was born in the 1950s. I was more interested in playing baseball and hanging around in the candy store. She wanted me to go to yeshiva. She wanted me to be a rabbi like her family. And, um, and that wasn't me. So I was torn because if I was to really honor who I was, um, I didn't take that route. And now that I look back and to think that I never got married, I never had family, and, and if you connect the dots, you can see that um, when love is smothering, the way my mother smothered me, that ended up putting me on a track where I felt if I met a woman and wanted to, and wanted to get into a serious relationship, eventually I would feel that my identity was being taken away the way my identity was taken away by my mom. So you could connect the dots and see why that happened. Two more minutes. Um, All right, as I said, they wanted me to be a pious Jew and follow the footsteps of my grandfather. They were overly negative. Uh, to them, the world was a dangerous place. I remember there was a time, I'm telling you, I could remember this. They, she was hanging clothes on the clothesline, and I was laughing about something. And again, i got to remind you, I didn't speak a word of English until I got into the second grade. My language was Yiddish. When I got into school, I spoke Yiddish to the kids. And they thought I was from the planet Mars. They didn't know where I was. They didn't know who I was. And so I remember her saying to me something about, what are you laughing about? Don't you know life is to suffer? She said this to me in Yiddish. I could swear this is what she said to me, and I didn't understand. The, and I was just a little kid. 
But anyway, she was always she always looked at it as life, as the world being very dangerous. As she got older, if she heard like sirens outside, she would run to the door to make sure the doors were locked. And then when she ended up getting Alzheimer's, she relived that whole thing again. I remember visiting her in Miami Beach. She was in the kitchen making food for the family, Rivka and Bella and all her aunt, and all her sisters. And I walk in, I said, Mom, what are all these plates doing on the, on the dining room floor? And she's in the kitchen with all the pots going. She said, well, I'm making dinner for the, 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 the sisters and the brothers. And I said, Mom, they've been dead for 40... And I shouldn't have said this. I said, they've been dead for 40 years. And she just burst out in tears. It was, it was horrible. So she actually had to go through it twice. Um, so... So my point is that um, they always looked at, at life very cautiously, although they really, they really were very warm people in the sense of I had friends over, they would always bring them into the kitchen, sit down, have something to eat. You know, she was always that kind of woman, but she was, a very, she was very headstrong. And I have to say, I mean, she needed to be if she was going to live. I mean, she was really the, the person who wore the pants in my family. They bought a house. They, they ended up living a rather productive lives for many years. But you can imagine in 1964 when the lawyers were, were taking testimony that they had to go back in 64 and recount everything that happened to them 10, 15 years before. And for them to do that, I'm sure it must have been incredibly difficult. So um, I think... I think that is about, about what I wanted to say about me as a child. So anyway, I want to open it up for questions. I know I went through this pretty quickly. Um, do you, is there anybody here that have any questions? No? Oh, yes, go ahead. Um, may I call you Maya first? Michael, Maya, you want to call me Maya? Yeah. <laughs> um, with the rise of anti-Semitism across the United States, even across the globe, um, because we've seen it even at Emory University, and I've seen some videos of other. Um, from your perspective, from what you, what you know, what are the similarities between then, 40s, and here in 2024? I see a lot of similarities, and I see some differences, too. Uh, in, in, I have a poster that I didn't bring. It was in Berlin, Germany in 1933. I got a picture of the students at the University of Berlin throwing books into the bonfire. The bonfire had SS and uh, brown shirts, I should say, brown shirts surrounding the bonfire, making sure no one was going to get in there. They were burning the books to deny people the truth. I thought at one time when I first started the book, it all comes down to educating the people about what happened. The kids. And the kids don't want to know. They don't, they're not interested in going back. They're, they're, not, they, they're not interested in being educated. They already have an idea of what this is all about. So, um, so, and, and so what happened, and I, it was so scary for me to see what's going on at, at the Columbia University and all the schools around the country, the similarities are chilling, chilling. I mean, you see thousands, thousands of students, and they're, and they're being egged on by demonstrators. Uh, I'm sorry, they're being egged on by professional people that are trying to get them riled up. Um, so I think we're in for some really tough times. I, I say we got to stay close to each other. Um, I don't think it's going to be, I pray, it's not going to be like what happened there because there's too many people in government and there's too many aware people in this country, Jewish or not Jewish, that, that's not going to let this happen. But I will tell you that when I turn on the TV and I see all this, it reminds me so much of what happened back then. So I'm saying in the end, I think uh, we're going to be okay, but it's going to be a very, very scary and unstable time until that happens. But I mean, I never thought the level of anti-Semitism, and it was always there, that undercurrent has always been there. It's just now coming out. 
Because I, I, I remember as a child, they, there was a lot of, when I was a child, there was antics. I could feel it. So, yeah, I think it's going to be scary. I, I think we're going to have to be in situations where there's going to be violence. People are going to be killed. And I'm afraid it's going to be really bad. But I think in the end we'll be all right. So <clears throat> it's a very basic question. Excuse my ignorance. But I also ask this for me and for my kids so they know. When you talk about how um, the soldiers, now a lot of the deaths were not by the hands of the soldiers, but it's the Lithuanians themselves, okay? So my question is, a lot of the soldiers, whether they agreed with it or not, they had to do it because they were orders. Here, they followed orders. But what motivated the people, their neighbors? What was in their mind? What was told to them that motivated to kill their Jewish neighbors? Yeah, because they weren't following orders from like the military were. What motivated them to do this? What and what motivated? similarity does it have with today? What motivates people to want to do that? What's their benefit? Was it a, was it a financial benefit for them to kill their neighbors that were Jewish? Was it a just no, a no, brainwash? No. What, what was their what was their benefit of killing their neighbors? That yeah, that was part of it. But that, but it goes way beyond that. And as I mentioned it before about them collaborating with the. Uh, with the Russian, when Germany arrived into Lithuania, and a year before that, the Soviets took over Latvia, Estonia, and, uh, and so when the Russians came in and started sending some of the uh, Lithuanian locals up to Siberia, taking away their factories and their offices uh, and their, their livelihood, when the Germans pushed the Russians back into Soviet Union, the Lithuanians, it was payback. Payback because they believed the Jews and the Russians were collaborating with each other to kill all these, all these Lithuanians. I mean, they were, the, the German, the Lithuanians, some Lithuanians were burning down hospitals and, and, and municipal buildings with, with Jewish people in there. People don't understand the number of Jews, the number of Jews who were killed during that time and, and again, with the, with the Lithuanians, they thought if we show the Germans that we're going to get rid of the Jews, that they were going to be given sovereignty to get the country of Lithuania back in the hands of the Lithuanians. It never happened because the, Lithu the Germans ended up killing the Lithuanians as the, as the Russians did. So that's what, now how I compare that to now, um, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a different situation except that you know they're tying Zionism and Judaism and and I think a lot of them don't even know what they're there to what they're there for they they don't know they just don't they're just following the the the, the people they don't know the history of Israel the history of how there have been times where Israel wanted to make peace with the Palestinians and the Palestinians said no they do not want they did not want side-by-side -side countries. They wanted all of Israel to be under the Palestinian rule. It's, it was a different situation. And so, um, and they don't know about the history of what happened in 1948 and 49 when J the Jews were given their own country. They don't know any of this. They think that the, that the Jews are colonialists. You know, they're there to take over the world. Um, back in German times, um, the Jews were blamed for World War I that they were blamed for the fact that uh, they were not patriotic and a lot of the Jewish who, Jews who ended up fighting in World War I, they said, the Germans are never going to take me. I fought for Germany in World War I. They were one of the first to go into the camps. So, um, so it, it was a situation where uh, it, was, it was very, it was a time where for the Germans it was... Uh, the, the, the anti-Semitism that goes back to the programs in Russia, it goes back to being considered uh, people who are not belonging to Christian, the Christian communities. Um, I, I can go into a lot of other things. I, I mean, I go into how even the word Aryan, Aryan, Aryan is not Ger German. Hitler was not German. Aryan is a word they use for the uh, Iranian hierarchy, noble. And, and for some reason, the Germans used Aryan as a noble people, the noble Germans. That word Aryan is out of Iran. It's not, it's not a German word. And so, um, it, 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 and so, yeah, it goes on to all this information I was going. Then you talk about the eugenics. 
That's another thing I talk about, the eugenics, about controlling the masses, controlling the breeding of... They looked at the Jews as being with the gypsies and the blacks, and they got to get rid of them from Darwin's uh, species of whatever. I forgot the name of it. But they, and so they picked up Darwin's philosophy, and they used it for Germany. We got to get rid of these people. It was... It was the bloodline rather than the belief. They were looking at the bloodline. We've got to get rid of these to have a, a, higher, a higher purpose. The humanity is going to get better. And, of course, they thought the Germans the master race. The Germans were the master race. And the Jews were comp- competing for that, and they were very threatened by it, so they wanted to kill them. Yes? I have um, a question. First of all, you said you started the book in 2017? Well, about 2017, 2018, yeah. I mean, over time, I mean, how long before you actually published it? I mean, that's a lot. 2000, 2021. So, three or four. That's a lot of information. I am telling you, and I'll I'll be honest with you. For me to stand here like this and give present, and I do this a lot, I am exhausted by the time I'm done here because it's so, so draining. And before I was doing, like, presentations maybe two, three a week, I was exhausted. Plus the fact... My, if you get my book or not get my book, my book is not being sold on Amazon. It's not being sold on Barnes & Noble. You can only get the book through my website. And I autograph every book, and I go to the post office every day, and I have to go through the post office to get them out. I did not want to go to a... To a I'm, based, I'm self-published. I get my books published at a place called Book Logic and Alpharetta. They publish. They actually print in my book. But I don't go through, you, you could, I'm, I think I'm number seven or eight Google throughout the whole world as being the most popular book that, that deals with the Holocaust and love stories. But the other, the other six or seven are all from Amazon. So, I mean, if I was on Amazon, I'd probably be number one. I also want to make a comment and just thank you for oh, thank doing you. this. Um, being Southern, Bible Belt, raised kind of European blood, um, British, all that. Um, a lot of this has been unknown to me for the majority of my adult life. But I, when you mentioned being at Kent State, that was probably whenever a movie came out about Kent State. I was a preteen, a teenager, and I remember so vividly being upset that that was something historically that happened that I had to find out about in a movie mm-hmm. and not through. I could, you know, not not through other sources, you know, and I would be like, why? Why would not this be told, you know, because that was, I, that was probably late 70s, early 80s, I guess, when, when I saw the movie. But that is what I'm hoping you're able to instill upon to some kids is that that I felt was like, no, this cannot be history that does not get told. No, that, that's, that's, that's the, my life mission now is to... Okay. Yeah, I mean, my first presentation was at a Baptist church. And when, that, when I showed them all this, they're, they're, they just could not believe. I mean, they didn't know any of this stuff. And I looked over at the audience, and their eyes were like, why I could not believe it. It was like a, an adult uh, learning center. Um, but, yeah, I mean, my, my mission right now is to get their legacy out so people know. And that's why I'm, I'm praying of a film coming out of this and the documentary. And I want to teach people... I mean, before I said I could, well, this group, I could, but I mean, I was trying to teach people out on the street. All you got to do is just tell them the history of the Jewish people, but they don't want to hear it. They, they're not interested. You even got some Jews that are demonstrating against the, against the Jews. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Right? Is it right? Yeah. Uh, yes, I also, <coughs> I also thank you and admire that you're taking it upon yourself okay. to bear witness to what happened so that the young generation knows that this really Oh, these are the kids. Yeah. And these are the kids. These are the kids, right? Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, thank you, Rabbi, for keeping these, <laughs> keeping these kids aware of what's going on. This is, this is terrific, guys. I'm telling you. You're living in very historic times right now. I mean, I never dreamt in a million years it would turn out. You know, I, I remember when, when I was reading, I said, this is never going to happen again. But when I started seeing what was going on in Columbia and NYU and all that, it was just like I couldn't believe it. Um, but, again, uh, there's outside instigators that are a big part of this. And so, and so, but then the kids just go along. I'm telling you, there's a lot of people out there that are demonstrating. They don't even know what they're there for. 
You know, they're just out there because they're sheeple. They just want to follow. And these are the people. And so, you know, I would imagine the same thing went on in Germany for a certain... But there was a lot more anti-Semitism back then. And of course, it was after World War I, and Hitler used that to separate the people to then take over because he was, you know, it was, the, the depression was going on about then. They didn't have a lot, and they all blamed the Jews. It's always the Jews, you know, and that's, and that's what's going on. I never thought that I would be seeing people on the street like this. But I knew there was undercurrent, but I never thought it would get to this point where now I'm afraid that people are going to pick up guns, and that's what really gets me concerned because it's just a matter of time. I think there's going to be some really hard times. Question was I don't really understand about who are these lawyers in the 1960s and um, what were your parents doing giving their story to lawyers? Well, they were they were there was 19 I got this in my book I got their letterhead and everything in my book um, they were giving testimony because they had to petition Germany in 64 to prove that what happened to my parents really happened and the way they would do that is to petition the German courts and they did get reparations for the death of my sister and my family, and that's how they bought their first house. So, I mean, the, the, that testimony, which I didn't know about until I got the, the, night, the night table, found those documents, that's what got me started on where I am today, because that is the nucleus of the book. If I didn't find those documents, I don't know if I ever, would ever have written the book, because I wouldn't have known a lot about this until I, I found those documents. And it, it was stuffed in a, in, a, in a manila envelope, and it was like my father didn't want anybody to see it, pushed it into the back of the bottom of his night table, and I'm picking this up, and, I'm open, and I never saw those documents before. And so that's what's at the museum. If you go to Holocaust, look up Michael Ruskin, you'll find it there. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, anybody else? Uh, yeah. Uh, you, what you have to realize is I, I worked on filling out quite a few documents for people to receive reparations from Germany because if you could prove what happened to your family, uh, whether they were killed in ghetto or they were killed in, in the camps, and you could prove, and you had the documents to prove this, Germany actually uh, took a huge chunk of their national budget and they have paid people reparations, which, of course, you realize money does not by these exactly. people's lives, yeah. but <clears throat> and still it was a big step for a government of Germany to own this and, and to actually act on this in such a way, but it did include a lot of lawyers presenting a lot of testimony and doing a lot of depositions with people, and there was a lot of translations going back and forth. Unfortunately, a lot of this information has now been preserved, and like just like Michael has, done, has taken it to the Holocaust Museum, now all of this testimony of people who are no longer with us actually exists. We have it documented. And it went into movies, you know. Uh, a lot of the uh, historical movies that are now being put together, they're being put together from these first-person testimonies. They were legal because they were actually notarized mm -hmm. and, and sealed in. And this is not just stories people tell. These were depositions that were given to lawyers for reparations. Yeah, there's a, there's a gentleman named Ken Burns. He's a documentary. His, his, my script writer comes from his crew. And, and he had a, a five-part series called The Holocaust, Ken Burns, very well known. So I'm one, he's, he's one of the guys I'm working with now. So I'm really, really hopeful we'll be getting a film out of this. I mean, when I, when I wrote this book, I had people coming on my Facebook page asking me, when is the movie coming out? And I wasn't even thinking about a movie back then. And now we're working on it. So what I was saying before about Silent Legacy, when we get these, and I'm coming out with a second book called The Aftermath. This will be my stories about what I told you about this, this the Christmas thing. I have so many stories that happened to me through my parents. But, I mean, so, so I'm hoping that the film will come out. Once the documentary is made and we get it on there, the next step will be a movie. That's what we're hoping for. So, yeah, it's really exciting. And this is what I wanted to do right from the beginning. I wanted this to be worldwide. And, by the way, I want you to know that I met the – I spoke to the guy who wrote a book about Anne Frank – and his mother was in the apartment building with his sister, my, this guy's sisters, and he believes his aunt was the one that snitched on the Franks living up on the second floor to the, to the local, the German, wherever they were, that they, that's how they got, that, that, that's how they got caught. So I, I think it's called the Annex or something, but we communicated back and forth. He saw my book on Facebook and we started talking. Great guy. He's from Holland. You know, so we talked a while, and his book is doing very well. But 
I, I met some incredible people. I mean, I met people from Auschwitz that made it through. Um, just amazing people I've spoken to, and they all, are, you know, they all thank me. And as I said, this is, you know, at, at my, I'm, I'm going to be 75 years old in December. Um, so, I mean, I, and, I, and I said to my wife, I said, why did I wait so long? And he said, you just, weren't, you just weren't there. You weren't ready yet. So, you know, I only got, and that's the other thing. I'm pushing this so quickly because I only got so many years left, and I want to make sure this gets out to as many people. It's almost like Schindler's List, you know, trying to get as many Jews saved as he could. I feel like I'm the same Schindler, like trying to tell the people what was going on so they all know what happened to my parents. So... But yeah, I mean, it's been, it's not, has not been easy, but I wouldn't have changed one day of what I'm doing now. I am working seven days a week, sometimes 12 to 15 hours a day. I'm on my computer because I'm marketing my own book. I'm not, no one's marketing. It's only me. I'm doing it alone. Otherwise, if I went to a publisher who was doing that, and they would be on, on Amazon, he would be doing some of the promotion. I'm doing this all by myself. But I got a really good team on. I got a good team that's putting together this Facebook page. I have thousands and thousands of followers. I spoke in the Ukraine on podcasts in France and the BBC. I'm all over Europe. Not in Israel yet, but we're working on it. But um, I'm, I'm, they know me over there as well. So, you know, I'm getting there. And I want this to be like a worldwide thing. So it's an incredible amount of work. But then, you know, this is what I'm here for. I believe my parents... This is, I believe this is my purpose. My life is, my life is, is now, is the purpose of my life, is to do this for my family. And you know, there's a lot of guilt. You know, you can imagine, my, my mother said to me, once you get married, God could take me to heaven. She wanted me married so, I don't want to go into the fact that I broke my engagement two weeks before the wedding. That's a whole different story. But they, she wanted me married so badly because it kind of confirmed her as a mother that she raised the child and now both my brother and I are married, that she's ready to go. She never saw that day. And that to this day, it breaks my heart. You can imagine she's the granddaughter of a rabbi. And I'm not really, I wouldn't consider myself a very, fru, you know, like I celebrate, you know, I honor the holidays, but she wanted me to be going to a yeshiva and really study to be a rabbi. I, not only that, but I was dating Gentiles. Most of the women I dated were not Jews. And a lot of that is because the more she pushed, the more I'd go in the other direction. I mean, I know what this, what this will happen, but I, I paid a really big price for being a son of Holocaust survivors, but I wouldn't change a thing. They were my greatest teachers. I wouldn't be here now if it wasn't for them. And I love them, and I, I pray every night and every day for for. for they rest in peace. And I'm sure they know what I'm doing. I'm just hoping they don't mind that um, I never got married, but it's all right. <laughs> anyway, uh, any other questions? I really appreciate you being here. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, speaking of Facebook, I was on Facebook. My wife knows that I'm pretty consistent being on Facebook and sharing my views on a lot of different topics. And one of the things that came up today was in relation to this particular topic. And um, I responded to a post, and I mentioned that um, Hitler and his um, staff, that they were into the occult, and that there was a lot, I, the way that I remember my comment was that either they were influenced, if not outright possessed, by demons. And I also included that in um, the Berlin Museum is the actual throne of Satan or throne of Zeus that they that was in Pergamum that's actually in Berlin. And so my question is, what is your thought, if any, about how all of this took place? Do you have any insight if you think that there is some spiritual component to it, some dark demonic component to this? Without a doubt. I think they, they, they practiced uh, Satanism. Um, they, they ended up sacrificing um, certain people. They, they were very heavily, especially Guren, um, Himmler, was very much into um, astrology and a lot of the dark side. 
even the swastika has some kind of symbol of, um, that goes back goes back thousands of years. Now, I will tell you this, and this is also something I found out. In fact, I think that, uh, um, I think Hitler himself had an astrology thing done telling him that this was the time to invade. And that's, what, that's why he invaded. And then, you know, he got to a point where he thought he was going to be the ruler of the world. And that was, um, that, that's, that's how they ended up, they, they didn't, they, they, they believed in a very dark side. And I, I, I read about that, too. Yeah, that's true. And even today, there's groups like that. Not, ger not, not Nazis, but they're, they're people that are into the dark side. Yeah, yes. Can you tell me your Facebook group again? The it's it's group. perfect. You want to go to Silent Legacy. You want to go there, you will see incredible stories that are written about the people, about their parents, as well as people like me. I'm getting a lot of people there, and those are the people that are going to be on my... my YouTube channel, because then once I get them on my show, it's going to be it's going to be really cool. Yeah. We also have a link on our Facebook, and you're welcome to visit our Facebook page. And we just link to Silent Legacy on ours, so oh, that way they nice. can nice. they can jump links and you just you. get there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Okay, I want you to stay here. Don't don't leave. Okay. Your parents told you a truth that we live in a dangerous world, and that's why they try to smother you in, in every way possible. And I think in many of our hearts, we're feeling that right now. We're living in a dangerous world. We still do. We still do. When I look at the pictures that you show in your book, I mean, I just, these are familiar faces. I look at your grandfather, Rabbi Chaim. You know, that's my son's name. His middle name is Chaim. And uh, Chaya, his wife. That's my daughter's name. Oh, that's too They're much. twins, Chaim and Chaya. Yeah. You know, we live on, we continue on, but so many people have lost. And I really appreciate you coming and telling this story and taking all the energy that you have right now in this point of life where you are yeah. and continuing just pressing on, just going from place to place. Anybody that would hear you, you basically want to tell them that story. I really appreciate you Thank coming you. and sharing this time with us right Thank now and letting our kids hear it and, and letting my congregation here hear the story again something that we're familiar with, but it's something that we need to be reminded with. And every connection point we make, every time we meet, every time I meet somebody who's a Holocaust survivor, or any time I meet somebody who's a family member of a Holocaust survivor, we make this bond, we make this connection that cannot be broken. Right. Thank you for Thank you. coming and making this bond with us Thank today. You. Thank you. Appreciate it. I appreciate it okay. so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. If anybody's interested in my book, I'm doing a book signing in the back if you're interested. You can go online and order the book as well.